بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Today inshallah I'm going to talk to you about the important role of women in changing the home and in changing the community and ultimately changing the entire ummah I'm not going to be giving you specific steps on how to change your home I'm going to talk to the women, to our mothers and to our sisters about their important role. Because many Muslim women feel that if they do not have a career, that they're less of a woman. And that if the woman does not work full time, that she's less than the other woman who has a career and who works full time. And that a lot of women also feel that getting an additional paycheck is more important than raising their children. So a lot, of, and, and as I speak, a lot of women will think we're saying don't work, don't have a career, don't pursue the education. And they will think that because of the negative image that a lot of people have regarding Islam. And some women even believe that Islam is unfair to women. But that's not what we're saying. I didn't say it's not important to have a career. I didn't say it's not important to get an education. I said the role in the home is more important than that. Because traditionally the father was the one that would be outside of the house all day. And then the mother would be the one who would start to first teach the children their first ayat of the Quran. The mother is the one that makes sure the first, the child, the first word that they say is Allah. She is the one that would encourage them to seek knowledge. But now both are in the street, the, pa the father and the mother, both parents. And so the children, they begin to have a lot of problems from values that they don't have, from morals that they don't have, from even the simple concepts such as bonding, which is when the infant bonds with the mother. And you can study the books of psychology and see what happens to children when they don't bond well with their mother during infancy. So the other negative image is that the woman is told your job is to cook and to clean. You see how derogatory they make it sound. All you have to do is cook and clean. That's not what we're saying. We're talking about raising scholars, raising the warriors of this ummah, raising the good Muslim men and women who will be the ones who will receive the victory or the upper hand of this ummah. And some women now, they're proud that they can't cook. They boast to you, I can't cook. Like it's such a good thing, mashallah. <laughs> You're such a modern woman now. You don't know how to cook, you must be a very educated woman. So many sisters can't sew a button if it breaks off a shirt or a garment. And they're proud of that, I can't sew. Oh mashallah, how advanced you are. Not that there is any shame with knowing how to cook. You know the role of, of the Muslim women when it comes to the Ummah? Someone described it or gave it a very beautiful comparison. It's like the role of the archers in the Battle of Uhud. They were not in the forefront, they were not in the thick of the action, but they had the most important position. They guarded the army and if they moved, the whole army would be uncovered and the whole army would be defeated. So you're the silent heroes. You're the ones doing all the great work. You're the backbone and the structure. You're the ones who teach the children and teach the Muslim men courage and honesty and truthfulness and patience and perseverance and kindness and confidence in themselves. You're the one who will do that, not your babysitter and not the nursery school who will only teach them to sing nursery rhymes. You're the one who will teach them that. And we're not saying, again, we're not saying don't work. You're, we're saying you are like the archers. The archers, when they left out trying to get the spoils, the army was uncovered and it was defeated. But same thing, when you leave this most important position to go out for the spoils, to go out for the extra paycheck or something like that, you leave the army, you leave the ummah uncovered. And you, know, you notice I mentioned courage, yes, when I said you teach courage and honesty and truthfulness. Uh, show of hands, which of the sisters uh, are courageous in this room? Okay, so, so a small percentage, the brothers can't see, but a small percentage of sisters are courageous. Now, honestly now, which of the, of the mother, mothers in the room 
Teach courage to their children. Show of hands. You teach your children to be courageous? Okay, that's good. That's good. Because these are qualities you don't find anymore. It's just, it's just too much now. You barely find a woman who will teach her son to be courageous. The son will throw a fit and scream and cry, and he's 12 years old, by the way, publicly in the market and all these things. She doesn't even tell him to act like a man, to behave, to be brave, to be strong. Even uh, the stereotypical Arab father, who is so strict and severe in the Arab lands, when he comes here, I was at the dentist, there was this kid, his turn was coming up, they didn't even put him in a dentist chair, this is in a waiting room. He's beating his father. He's 12 years old or something. And the father just wasn't reading the newspaper. I said, what happened to the good old Arab father? Okay. The Prophet ﷺ said to the Muslim woman, take care of your home, for that is your jihad. That, that means it's a very important position. And it's more important than the extra paycheck and more important than so many other things. The extra paycheck and the wealth you get from that can't compare the reward you'll get if your son becomes a great scholar of Islam or if your daughter learns her religion and teaches it to other women. And you know the story of Imam Malik rahimahullah. When he was a young boy, you know what he wanted to be when he grew up. Yes? He wanted to become a singer. And who is the one who changed his mind about that? It was his mother. She changed his mind. And she was the one who encouraged him to not become a singer. And she started to encourage him to want to study the religion. And the things that she would do. He was a young boy. She would dress him up like a young scholar. And she would put a turban on him and dress him up like a young scholar, this young boy. And sometimes she would walk with him to the masjid because he was too young to go to Fajr by himself in the dark. And she would tell him, go to Rabi'at al-Ra'i, this great scholar of Medina, and learn from his manners and learn from his knowledge. And she encouraged him to do that. The way she dressed him up as a small scholar or an imam, just the same way now we dress up our children as policemen and as firefighters and we make them love these occupations. How many people, and I just still would love to see the day when, after the Jum'ah khutbah, some father will bring his child and put him up on the mimbar and say, ha, huh, you see? Yalla, you're the Imam. Yalla, speak to the people. No, but we buy them these plastic badges and fake guns. Yalla, you're a police officer. You're a firefighter. So sisters, next Friday or any Friday when school is out, have, make sure your husband, he puts your son up on the mimbar and tells him, look, you're the Imam of the Ummah. Imam Ahmad, his father had passed away, and so his, mo his mother raised him. One man used to say about Imam Ahmad, he says, Kuntu ara Ahmad ibn Hanbal yuhyi layl wa huwa ghulam. I used to see Ahmad ibn Hanbal pray the night, stand the night in prayer while he was a young boy. Where do you think he learned that from? It was from his mother. And the excellent relationship is very famous, the excellent relationship he had with his mother, and how obedient he was to his mother. Ibn Hajar rahimahullah. His mother didn't encourage him to, to knowledge. It was said that his older sister was well versed in language and poetry. She was the one who got him interested in knowledge. Ibn al-Jawzi, another great scholar of Islam rahimahullah. His aunt was the one who got him interested and the one who took, took him to learn from the muhaddithin. Rabi'at al-Ra'i, this, this teacher of Imam Malik that we mentioned earlier, his mother spent thousands of dinars that her husband left her, she spent it on educating her son, who became a great scholar in the Masjid al-Nabawi in Medina. And Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal is mentioned that he had over 400 teachers. He studied with over 400 scholars during his travels. But amongst them were women scholars. Imam Malik had his daughter Layla, who used to memorize the book Al-Muwatta. And she memorized it so well that if one of the students made a mistake, and the Imam didn't catch the mistake, she would knock on the door because she would be listening. Then the Imam would ask him to repeat himself. He would pay attention that someone made a mistake. The daughter of the great scholar Sa'id ibn Musayyib, when she got married, her husband got dressed to go to the halaqa. She said, where are you going? He said to the halaqa of Sa'id, she said, sit down, I'll tell you what Sa'id says. That's the amount of knowledge that she had. But we don't even need to go that far. What if we start right at the beginning? with Khadija radiallahu anha. I mean, if anyone wants to underestimate the role of women in building this ummah and in creating scholars and in creating warriors, 
Just look at the role of Khadija radiallahu anha. And where would Islam be and where would the Meccan da'wah be without Khadija radiallahu anha? Even when the Prophet ﷺ, before he became a Prophet, when he loved to go and meditate and, and do the tahannuth, sit in the cave for a long time, sometimes he would stay for a month, she would send the servants there to, to give him food. So he wouldn't have to interrupt himself and come back all the way to the city to get some food. She would send servants to him to give him food. But look at the instructions she would give them. Because she knows her husband وسلم, is dedicated to something and wants to do something. She would tell them, just put the, the food at the mouth of the cave and leave. Don't walk in and distract and talk about the news and what's happening in the village. She would tell them that. Look at the attention to detail. Look at how when the Prophet ﷺ came back and he was afraid and he said, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, cover me. She covered the Prophet ﷺ. And she waited until he calmed down, then she asked him what happened. And if this were to happen and the woman is not wise, you come in, there's a calamity, you say, cover me. She said, what for? What happened? Cover me. What happened? No, you won't cover you until you tell me what's going on. Now you have two calamities instead of one. Look at her analysis when the Prophet ﷺ explained to her what happened. She immediately saw this can't be from the shaitan, it can't be from the jinn. She analyzed it quickly that you are the Prophet of Allah. Why? Because of the goodness of the Prophet ﷺ. And then she takes him to Waraq ibn Nawfal who confirms what she's saying. Look at how she supported the Prophet ﷺ financially. How she suffered alongside the Prophet ﷺ. Where would the early da'wah be if the Prophet ﷺ had a wife that nagged him? Where would it be? Where would the da'wah be if she would tell him, you don't spend time with me, stay home with us, let's talk, let's have a, you know, a candlelight dinner tonight or something like that. And the successful du'at also had good wives who supported them. So look at it in terms of reward. Look at the amount of reward you get when one of your children becomes a scholar of the Ummah. Or your husband is a da'i, but you allow him to go out on journeys and you allow him to go and do the work. Whereas if you constantly nagged him to stay home and so on and so forth, which he needs to give you the, your rights from that, but if, if it was so severe that he couldn't go out, you think he, you don't get the share of the reward when he goes out and does good work? Of course you do. Where would the Muslim Ummah today be without the believing women who allowed their sons to go out in jihad, who allowed their husbands to go and call to the light of Allah Azza wa Jal, and who would allow their children to pursue Islamic knowledge. Now let's be realistic. We don't just want uh, to, to give a touchy-feely and uh, uplifting kind of talk and not be realistic with ourselves. So now I'll ask the sisters a question, because you are the important ones here. I'll ask you this question and you answer it to yourself. Are you willing and ready to raise children for the sake of Allah, for the sake of this religion, and for the sake of the Ummah? Just answer yourself by yourself. Are you really willing to raise children for the sake of this deen? To give the upper hand to the Ummah of Muhammad So if you answered yes to yourself, now answer this question. If you have a son, who is very intelligent and bright and gets the highest grades and you expect him to become a doctor or an engineer and then he tells you I want to study Islam I want to become an Imam and you're sitting at a gathering and sister so and so her son has been accepted at Harvard University and sister so and so her son will become a genetic engineer the other one a nuclear physicist the other one a cardiologist and what's your son going to be, sister? <coughs> what? <coughs> Would you accept that? You know, the way we belittle the deen these days, besides the fact that we have, as one speaker put it, the dumbest people to go study deen, in some situations, I mean. But, Besides that, people always ask this question, study deen? What are you going to be when you grow up? An imam? And they see it as a ridiculous thing. You're going to become an imam? And they forget the dua in the Quran. Make me an imam for the muttaqeen, for the people of taqwa. It's not an easy thing and it's not an easy position. 
So what is the difference between the reward you would get if your son is an imam or a da'iyah and the wealth you would get if your son is a doctor or an engineer? And once again, we're not saying studying medicine is not good. Some people will take it that way. And we're not saying engineering is not good. We're saying it's good, but it's not the best. The best is the study of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is number one. But this is something that we, we can't even fathom nowadays because we put it at the bottom, the lowest rung of the ladder, studying the religion of Allah. There was, uh, yeah, there's a true story where a man had two children and one of them wanted to become a doctor and the other wanted to study Sharia. So the father was very angry with the one who wanted to study Sharia, but he kept praising the one who became a doctor. And the one who studied Sharia then, when he graduated and he became an Imam or a leader of the Muslims, he was, and the father became very ill. And the Imam is the one, because he understood these values, he was the one that took care of his father. All his life, the father was proud of the doctor. But when he was on his deathbed and he was ill for a while, the doctor never came to visit him and didn't give him any attention. And the Imam was the one that would walk him to the restroom, he would wash him, he would help him with wudu, he would feed him, he would take care of him, he would stay by his side at night. It was the Imam. And then only at his deathbed did he realize that the position of Imam is far more honored than any other position. So only at his deathbed did he realize that. And we pray that people realize it now before it's too late. So what's the relationship? How much wealth would you get if your son is an engineer or a doctor versus how much reward would you get if your son is a scholar or if your daughter also learns the religion she teaches it to others? You know the great scholar Abu Yusuf, the student of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Imam Abu Yusuf and he was one of, of those who really did the most work for the uh, Hanafi Madhab and he was the one basically who put together the books and the volumes and formulated a lot of the opinions along with some other students of the Imam. But Imam Abu Yusuf one time, he was sitting with the Khalifa Harun al-Rashid and Harun al-Rashid offers him to eat from al-Falawzaj. Al-Falawzaj is it's basically a kind of sweet, very nice kind of dessert. So to honor him, he offers him to eat first from al falawdaj So Imam Abu Yusuf, and he, later on he becomes like uh, Qadi al Quda, which is like uh, kind of like Chief Justice. And he would he had been an, uh, and basically he smiles. And so the Khalifa Harun al Rashid tells him, and why are you laughing? Amir al Mu'minin is offering you to eat first, even in one narration he gives him with his hand, the food in his mouth, which is the way the Arabs used to honor someone. So then the Imam smiles, Abu Yusuf. So he tells him that I'm not smiling because of that, but because of something that happened a long time ago. He tells him I was an orphaned young boy, and my mother used to send me to a craftsman, you see? And I used to, es to learn a skill, basically. And I used to escape and go and sit at the halaqa of Imam Abu Hanifa. So this is the typical situation. He wants to study religion, but the mother wants him to study something where he will get some kind of wealth from it. And so his mother would come, when she wouldn't find him at the craftsman, she would know that he skipped the, yani the, the craftsman's class to go study with Imam Abu Hanifa. And she would come to the halaqa, and she would yell at him, and she would tell him, nothing corrupted you except this man, meaning Abu Hanifa. And Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, would tell her, leave him, for I teach him the knowledge which, with which the kings will feed him the falawdaj in his mouth. And it happened so many years later, and that's why when he was offered the sweet, he smiled. He remembered what the Imam told him. So much honor that the man got. Just like others of the, of the teachers of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah, where the father used to insist that the boy works with him at the business, but the boy would go to, to, the, to the halaqa of the scholar, and the scholar was the judge of the city. So when one day the, the child is sick, the judge and all the important people and the nobles come to the house of the boy to see where he was. He was such an excellent student. So the father tells him, I never thought the judge and all these important people would come and knock at my door. And from that day forward, he let the boy go and study the religion.
So realistically then, to our mothers and to our sisters, your child, if they wake up on a Saturday and they have to go to Quran school, which is only about two hours of, of school time, and they wake up and they're tired that day, will you let them stay? Or how would your reaction be compared to if they wake up Tuesday morning and they say, I don't want to go to school today? How dare you? You don't want to go to school today? There will be a lot of things. There will be beatings and whipping and biting and all kinds of things. How dare you don't want to go to school today? But if it's Quran school, it's Saturday, it's his day off, stay. It's okay. You know, the best students we found in, in these Islamic schools, especially the part-time schools, always, always, the best students are the ones whose parents care about them coming to that school. Always the students with the best grades in these Islamic schools, are, meaning the weekend schools, are the ones whose parents say, you know, what did you, they teach you today? Do you have any homework? Do you have anything to study? These are always the best students. And the worst ones are the ones whose parents don't care. I used to teach in one school for five years. Many times the students wouldn't come. Where were you last weekend? I was just tired, I didn't feel like coming. And your parents let you? Yeah, they let you. I would love to see the conversation at that household if Wednesday morning he says, I don't feel like going to school today. No way. No way. There's gonna be beating, there's gonna be yelling, no way. So, how many of the sisters, and again ask yourself this question, so we can realistically assess ourselves. The, the point is not to make you feel guilty, or to put you in the hot seat, or make you feel that you're not worth it, worth it, or anything like that. No. The point is just, let's be realistic. How many of the sisters wake up their, their children who have reached praying age for Fajr? Okay. Uh, all right, Dr. Mulkhair for putting your hands up. I, I didn't want you to, to put your hands up so that those who don't put their hands up will be يعني, put in the hot seat. But uh, I was just recently talking to someone يعني, in the Muslim land and he was talking to me about how all his children go to the masjid for Fajr. They all wake up and they all walk to the masjid. Then they're like 10 and 9 and 12 and so forth. I think the oldest was 13. But all of his three sons go with him to Fajr every single day. Whether they have school or not. He said, it took my wife a year to recognize that they should go to Fajr. She would say, no, they're sleeping. Well, obviously they're sleeping. It's 5 a.m. What do you expect then? They're sleeping, yeah. But we wake them up and they go to the masjid. Now, a year later, now she's just used to the idea that yes, yes, they're young, but they should go. You know, so many times, and, and this is what we're talking about. You know, where is the courage? Where is the iman? Where is this type of tarbiyah? It's always, oh, let him sleep. And it's so sad that Allah, and, and I pray no, of, none of the sisters in this room are from that group. A lot of times tarbiyah now, raising children, has come down to two things. Eat and put on your jacket. That's it. Put on your sweater. Put on a jacket. Where's your hat? Where's your mitten? Eat. Eat. You didn't eat. Eat. Finish your vegetables. Eat. This is tarbiyah now. Eat. 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 Let me tell you something, sisters. This is some logic here, just pure logic, okay? No emotion, all right? There is no living thing on the planet that will not eat if it needs to eat. There isn't. I'm serious. And, and I'm not just يعني, trying to be funny. I mean, even my wife, I try to explain this to her. She's trying to force the food down the kid's mouth. He doesn't want to eat. No living thing will be hungry and not eat. You know why our children hate food? They don't want to eat because we force it down their throat. Other people, they punish their children. They say, no dinner tonight. The child will get oh, upset. No dinner tonight? You know why? Because they let them eat naturally. When they force it down their throat, it's a horrible thing. When I lived in Pakistan, my mother used to force me to drink buffalo milk. I hated it. It was fresh, it was thick, and they used to put some other spices inside of it and I would throw up the milk back into the glass and my mother would beat me and I have to drink the vomit back. <laughs> Wallahi, I'm not exaggerating. You mean, do you think I'll die if I don't drink that milk? Leave the milk. No living being will be hungry and not eat. So let the child just eat. Don't force them, don't stuff food down their throat. And tarbiyah is not just eat and make sure you have a jacket on. Did you put your sweater on? I know uh, one sister, she lets her children go just as they go. 
And one day if they go to school and it's a cold day without a jacket, believe me, they're also intelligent. Next day, they'll remember how they were freezing all of recess, they will take their jacket next day. So these are things we focus on that we don't need much attention anyways. All living beings that, with, you know, decent brain will take care of these things. Eating and putting on a proper coat or a jacket, things of that sort. But so many times we find these issues and you'll tell, you might tell your wife, you know, wake me up at this time, all right? So I'll pray and so I'll do this and I have to go there. So then you wake up, you know, hours later, you know, miss Salah or whatever. Why don't you wake me up? Well, I, you look so calm. Well, what do you expect? Typically when people sleep, they usually look calm, yani. What do you expect them to look like? <laughs> Strangling and hitting things. They look calm. Always women do that, yani, in my family at least. Why don't you wake me up? You look so calm. It's normal. I warned you that I was about to sleep, yani. So I'll look calm. But, again, I'm talking about the, this feeling of, you know, what is important and what comes first and what is essential. Like we're talking about Fajr for children. They think it's like a nightmare if the child wakes up early for Fajr. He can go back to sleep and they'll do a good job at that. And they'll do a good job at taking the, the, the nap when they come back from school or whatever, whenever time it is for that nap. So, so sisters in Islam, then you have a special place and you have a pivotal role. And if you are righteous, most likely you will have good children. And many times the young men and women who commit sins and do the sins openly, they didn't get a good upbringing most of the time. Allah Azza wa Jal has given you the greatest position and the greatest role in this ummah. And it's not the position of being a secretary or being this or being that, but it's being the one who is the backbone and part of the integral part of the success of this ummah and the strength of this ummah. So don't be ashamed of that, this great position Allah Azza wa has given you. I mean, there is, is, there is a kafir organization in the United States that their whole job is to promote the position of homemaker, they call it. Yani, homemaker. And they have bumper stickers uh, to the effect of, you know, homemaker is the most important job, or I have a very important job, I'm a homemaker. I mean, even this kafir group realizes the importance of taking care of the home. And it's not the television who will raise your children, it's not the babysitter, and it's not the daycare center. Allah Azza wa Jal honored you, the Muslim woman. And so do not allow anyone to dishonor you. Allah Azza wa Jal gave you this great honor. I remember one time, uh, when my wife was telling me there was an Islamic event at a hotel like this, and there was another event يعني, within the hotel, and for that event there was a dancer, يعني, like a belly dancer, invited. So she was getting dressed in the restroom and the Muslim women were there. So they were talking to her and it wasn't giving her da'wah unfortunately. They were looking at the, the, you know, the little things that shake and glitter and at her outfit while she was putting on her haram little outfit. So, so my wife was telling me how the dancer suddenly looked at the Muslim women, they were all wearing hijab and jilbab. She said to them, you can't wear things like this, can you? And all of them said, yes, yes, we can. And they don't mean at home. She's talking, yeah, you, can't, you couldn't do what I do. And they're trying to show her, yes, we can be like you. But you're in a position of honor. You bring yourself down to being dishonored? Or you tell her, no. And Allah Azza wa Jal gave us far better than that, than to uncover ourselves and go dance in front of people, in front of men. And they could give her da'wah, but they didn't. They're like, how much does this cost? And what's the, the thing that jiggles and makes this sound? And all these things. Allah Azza wa commanded everyone to respect you. Everybody was commanded to respect you. Just from the normal men, from the يعني, average man, from the man in public, to not look at you, to, to lower their gaze, to not make you an object. From your children, Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, وَوَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانِ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمْلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَامَيْنِ أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ Here, Allah Azza wa now is telling your children to take care of you. Your children to honor you. Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying, and we have enjoined upon the human being to take care, to take good care of his parents. Then Allah specifically talks about the woman, how she carried him travail upon travail, يعني difficulty upon difficulty, and she weaned him for two years. So show gratitude to me and to your parents. 
Show gratitude to me and to your parents, for to me is your final goal or your final return. The Prophet ﷺ also was asked by a man, Ya Rasulullah, man ahaqqu nasi bi husni sahabati? Which of the people deserves, yani, the, most deserves my, my good treatment or my good companionship? And the Prophet ﷺ tells him, Ummuka, thumma ummuka, thumma ummuka, thumma abuk. Your mother, and then your mother, and in one nation is asking, then who? Your mother, and then whom? Your mother, three times, and then your father. So your children have been asked to honor you and to respect you. Your husband has been asked to honor you and to respect you, or commanded more correctly. The Prophet ﷺ in the farewell pilgrimage in front of a hundred thousand of the companions, he said, Allah was tawsu bin nisa'i khayran. Allah was tawsu bin nisa'i khayran. He reminds the men to, to, to take good care of their women. So the husband commanded to take care of the woman. The children commanded to take care of the woman. And in the hadith in Ibn Majah and Tirmidhi, the Prophet وسلم, said, خيركم, خيركم لأهله, The best of you is the best of you to his family. And I'm the best of you to his family. And this is the truth here. So now for the brothers, the best of you in this room, you should be the best to your family. But some people, they don't realize this and they think there are just different parts and segments to Islam. So the brother will be in the masjid, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. But he goes home, uses the F word with his wife. One of the brothers used to kill us talking about da'wah, 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 da'wah. We're going to take over the world, we're going to take over the earth, we're going to start here, we're going to start there. This guy was going to take over the earth. But then with his wife, he uses the F word. He puts her and his own son, his flesh and blood, to just to teach her a lesson, he'll throw her in a homeless shelter with the drug addicts and the drunkards. And he's talking about da'wah. And he uses such bad words. Total different personality at the home. So the best of you is the best of you to his family. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I am the best amongst you to his family. That is the true measure. And I know of a person, every minute you meet him, Sheikh so-and-so has a lecture on this. Sheikh so-and-so is coming to the masjid. There is a lecture in the masjid on this date. That's all he spoke about. But his reality, he would beat his wife so severely, so severely, that he would have to take her to the emergency room after beating her. And I'm talking about beating like in the movies. And I'm, it's not funny. Knee to the, to the gut, you know, elbow to the back, punch to the face. And then he would take advantage of the fact that she can't speak English and take her to the emergency room and say, oh, she, she rolled down the stairs. Every minute you meet him, Sheikh so-and-so, Sheikh so-and-so. And then one day, he made the major mistake of, of striking her in public and a woman saw that. And you know that the phone was already on 911. All she had to do was hit send. She hit send and the police came and took him away. But you know what this poor woman said? And just shows you how great women are. This poor woman, this guy's been beating her and using her like a punching bag for so long. She said, the saddest thing I've ever seen in my life is when he was sitting in the back of the police car and they were taking him away. He should have been like, he should be happy. But no, she was her. So the best of you is the best amongst you to his women. And so many traditional things have come and so many ways of treating the woman and being harsh with the woman. And I remember when I was married, people were giving me advice on how to be harsh with my wife. Why? What kind of advice is that? Plus it didn't work anyways. <laughs> you know before, heads would roll, heads would be cut, blood would fall if one woman was hurt. When the Jews of Medina, how they hated the hijab of the Muslim woman. So one Muslim went to the market of Banu Qaynuqa and they tried to get her to uncover her face to, sh to show them something and she refused. And while she was sitting, the, the merchant, he occupied her so another man came and he tied uh, from her headpiece to like the, the lower garment. So when she would get up, she would be uncovered. So when she got up after that and she was uncovered, she screamed. And these Jews of Medina were happy and they were laughing at that. So a Muslim was overtaken by Ghira and he took his sword and he came and he killed that man. And so the rest of the people jumped on him and they killed him. 
And so the Prophet وسلم, when he heard what they did to one woman, and then the result of that, what they did to and killed one man, he gathered the entire army and he besieged all of them, this entire group, this entire tribe, because of one woman. And the Prophet وسلم, when they surrendered, he was going to have them all executed. But the hypocrite Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul came and he kept telling them, kept telling the Prophet وسلم, أحسن إلى موالي يعني he's like be good to because يعني like he had a relationship with them so he kept telling the Prophet to treat them well to treat them well and the Prophet would move away from him and then in the end he grabbed the Prophet and said أحسن إلى موالي and the Prophet was angered and he said هم لك he left he left them because this man kept insisting but all that was done for the sake of one woman and the Khalifa المعتصم بالله even though he whipped the great Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and he caused a lot of hard, hardships يعني, to the scholars and to Imam Ahmad in particular, Ibn Athir mentions in his book Al Kamil fi Tariq how a, a woman, a Muslim woman, was captured by the Romans in the city of Amuria and they tried to dishonor her, and, and some will tell you that they, they hit her. So she screamed out, Wa Mu'tasimah. Mu'tasim is the Khalif. She said, Oh Mu'tasim. So then a man came and brought this news to Al-Mu'tasim. They said that, he told him that a woman was يعني, hurt or injured or insulted by the kuffar and she called your name. Wa Mu'tasima. So he said, Labbaik, I'm here at your, at your call. I'm here to answer your call. And he gathered an entire army and conquered and destroyed and trampled the enemy and took over the entire city and he freed that one woman. This was the case. This is how the Muslim woman was honored in our history. This is how Allah Azza wa has honored you. But we apologize. And I apologize on behalf of all the Muslim men. We apologize to all the Muslim women worldwide how we have let them down. How we have become desensitized to the images of Muslim women in hijab constantly crying and screaming in front of the cameras because someone killed their children, someone murdered their husband, or someone demolished their home. We apologize to the Muslim women. But the truth is, Allah Azza wa has given you a position of honor, and that of being the most important factor, and that of being the most important ingredient in the advancement and in the upper hand of our ummah, insha'Allah. Again, my point was not to give you steps in what you can do to bring Islam into your home or steps into what you can do to bring the ummah into, into the light and all of that. But the idea was that we take a realistic look and see, are we on that path within just your home? Before we get to the ummah, before we get to the community, on, in your home, are we on that path towards that direction? If not, you can fix it. There are some basic things you don't need me, you don't need any lecture. You know there are some basic things that you can fix so you can be headed towards that direction. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give victory to Islam and to the Muslims and to give the Muslims the upper hand. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah al-azim alaykum min jami'a al-dhunub wa sallallahu wa barak ala muhammad wa ala alihi sahbihi ajma'in. Zakum Allah khairan for your attentive listening. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.